Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felding. Okay, it's good again to have you back, and I uh, guess you all got served your coffee and everything. And for those of you joining us on television, again, we just thank you for being with us. We thank you for your kind letters. My mail time just seems to be getting better every day. And uh, we just praise and thank the Lord for it. We thank you for your financial help. In fact, as we noted in our newsletter, you've all been so good. We were able to take on a few more stations, and uh, we're not going to hoard the money. And it's available. We're going to use it for God's glory. And, uh, you know, I, I always appreciate the fact when people come by to visit us and they suddenly realize we don't live any different than our neighbors up and down the road. Uh, don't expect a mansion when you come to visit Les and Iris Feldick because uh, we're not into that. We're, uh, we're just as common and ordinary in our lifestyle as anybody else. But we appreciate everything that you do for us so that we in turn can serve the Lord in what he has given us to do. All right, we're in the Minor Prophets and we're starting with Hosea. And uh, just for a little recap, in case we got somebody that missed our last program, Hosea writes in the same vein as Isaiah and Jeremiah, and it's all a warning to the nation of Israel to either come out of their idolatry and their unbelief or God's wrath is going to fall. And uh, as we were just discussing at break time, you know, that's the way God has dealt with Israel over and over. And uh, after the chastisement comes the blessing. And uh, I guess it was Dick that said, well, now I can't quite figure it out. I said, well, what do you do with a kid? You whip his little rear end and hope that it'll straighten him out. See? Well, that's the way it was with Israel. She had to have a good whipping once in a while, and then it would have its results. And then it wouldn't be long, and then down they'd go, see? In fact, the book of Judges, that's just what it is. It's a roller coaster. And they'll go up to a time of tremendous blessing, and uh, they're obedient, and then down they go. And then in would come the hard times, and the enemies would overrun them, and then they'd cry out, in would come a righteous judge, and up they'd come. And so that's Israel's history. Well... Hosea, of course, is living at a time, as we pointed out, only about 200 years after King Solomon. And northern ten tribes have already gone as far into idolatry as a nation of people could go. And consequently then, with Hosea living in Judah, which is still close to the temple and they're still not as prone to idolatry as the northern kingdom, Hosea is instructed to go up to idolatrous Israel and take a wife. And that's what I pointed out then in our last half hour, that he did not go to a house of ill repute, like a lot of people think the language implies. No, he went up to idolatrous Israel to take a wife, because God is going to show symbolically the future of Israel. All right, so then we came down as far as verse 2. I guess that's all the further we got. Oh, yeah, book number 70. My little wife is pointing at the blackboard. We are starting book number 70 today. All right, so back in Hosea chapter 1, <clears throat> we'll repeat verse 2. So the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, the idolatrous northern kingdom, and the children of whoredoms. For the land hath committed great whoredom, departing, from the Lord. Now, lest you think that I am barking out of left field, let's go up to the New Testament a minute. I wasn't going to do this, but I think maybe we should. Go up to Colossians. All the way up to Paul's little letter to the Colossians. Chapter 3, verse 5. And remember from our last program, we were stressing that the very first of the Ten Commandments was, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not bow down to them. And so idolatry and unbelief, I guess, are the two biggest controversies that God has with the human race, not just with Israel, but with everyone. All right, now look what Paul writes to the Gentiles at Colossae. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, and I'm making the point now why God 
hates idolatry. Verse 5. Paul, of course, writing to you and I as believers, he says, mortify or put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, that is, the members of this physical body, the appetites of it, put it to death. And what are they? Fornication. That, of course, is sexual immorality. Uncleanness. Inordinate or unnatural affection. Evil. Kashapisans, in other words, just constantly thinking and talking on the wrong side of the coin. And here it comes. And covetousness, and covetousness is what? Idolatry. Have you ever thought of it that way? Have you ever thought of it that covet, coveting is idolatry? Why? When you covet, what do you show? What you want. When you covet something, you want it. Well, why do you want it? Because it's almost a god to you, see? And so it, it just snowballs. All right, let's back up a little ways to Ephesians. Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 5. <clears throat> Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 5. All got it? For this you know, that no whoremonger or an immoral person, nor an unclean, nor what? Covetous. See the categories, how they all stick together? Nor a covetous man who is an idolater. Have you ever caught that before? So why do you suppose the apostle said that the, the sin that really got him to consider his sinfulness was which one? Which one did he mention? Coveting. It's the worst of all. And I've made mention of it down through the years. You stop and think, can you break any other of the nine commandments without coveting first? Can't do it. Coveting is the root cause, see? And that's why God hates it so, because it's the thing that leads to idolatry. Okay, so read this verse again. So, for this you know, that nor whoremonger, nor an unclean person, nor a covetous man who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. They're not going to be there. Now, you see, we've made the point before. Paul doesn't speak of people going to the lake of fire, but he just uses the other approach that they're not going to be in glory. Well, if they're not in glory, then the lake of fire is their destination. All right, let's come back to Hosea then, if I've established that, that God hated idolatry. Now, I guess I'd never really thought of it before until I was making preparation for this the last, really, several months, I guess, off and on. When Israel was in Egypt, when the whole nation of Israel had finally found their way down to Egypt because of Joseph and the food that was available, what were they surrounded with already in Egypt? Idolatry. And I know when I taught the Exodus, when we came to the plagues, I made the point that every plague that God brought on Egypt was one of Egypt's gods. And that's what made it such, a, such an object lesson for the Egyptians. In other words, when he turned the Nile River into blood, what was the Nile River in the religious life of Egypt? It was a god. They worshipped it. The flies, they worshipped them. The frogs, they worshipped them. See? Anything that practically lived and moved, the Egyptians had already made it a god. Well, that's what Israel had been surrounded with. So then, you see, when they got down around Mount Sinai, as we mentioned in the last program, and Moses was up in the mountain, they didn't know what had happened to him, and they'd forgotten all about the miracle of the Red Sea. So now they come to Aaron, who is the secondary leader, and say what? Make us a god, like we had in Egypt, see? Oh, it, it's, it's insidious. And just because we're living in a culture that has nothing to do with gods of 
silver and gold and stone and so forth. That doesn't mean that there's nothing that can be an idol. Everything around us can become an idol. And that's our whole materialistic situation today. It's really boiling down to an idolatry that takes all the thoughts of God away from their mind. And my, we're seeing it all around us, aren't we? Okay, back to Hosea. And so he goes up to Israel. Verse 3. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibliim, who conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel. For yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. Now you got to know your Old Testament. Who ruled and reigned in Jezreel? Ahab and Jezebel. Jezebel, the most wicked woman that ever lived. And she had such control over the Jewish people of Israel that they had gone just as deep into it as she had gone. And so what's the warning? You're going to be punished just as severely as she was. Now, I'm not going to repeat on television what was the end of Jezebel. Well, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty. If you don't know what it was, go look it up when you get home tonight, and you probably won't sleep. But anyway, God is warning them. As Ahab and Jehu and Jezebel, that's what's coming for you if you do not turn around. See? All right, verse 5. And it shall come to pass, God says, at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Now, today we call it the valley of Esdralon or even the valley of Megiddo. It's that beautiful valley about, uh, oh, just a few miles north and west of Galilee. And it stretches all the way over to Mount uh, Hermon. No, not Mount Hermon. Uh, Carmel which is just a little ways from the city of Haifa, which is in the news lately. But it's a beautiful valley. My, we stand on the high cliffs of Nazareth, and we look out over the valley of Megiddo, and it is just unbelievable, the beauty of that valley, especially now that it's been brought back into production. Okay, so that was the whole symbolic purpose of the birth of this first son, that he will be a picture of the horrors of Ahab and Jezebel who uh, inhabited Jezreel. Okay, now verse 6. She conceives again. She's going to have a second child. And this time it's a daughter. And God said unto him, that is unto Hosea now remember, call her name Lo-Ruhamah, for the name means I'll not have pity. For I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Now, before we get judgmental against our merciful God, turn back with me to Second Chronicles. I think I want my I hope. Seventeen Kings. I'm sorry. Second Kings, honey. Second Kings. <clears throat> Chapter 17. Now here the scripture makes it explicitly clear why God had to take such stringent disciplinary action against the ten tribes of Israel. Second Kings 17. And oh my goodness, I'd like to read it all, but... I'm always afraid that if I read too much scripture, somebody might grumble and uh, lose attention and so forth. But I'm just going to hit some of the highlights. But in 2 Kings chapter 17, let's drop down to verse 7. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God the same God who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. And they walked in the statutes of the heathen, 
That would be, of course, the Canaanites after they went in under Joshua. Whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. They built them high places in all their cities. Now i got to stop because I'm afraid a lot of times people don't stop and think. Why do you suppose idolaters always built their places of worship on the highest elevation possible? You ever thought about that? To get closer to God, wherever he's at. See? And so they'd always go to a high place and to worship their dead idols. And yet, they were recognizing that there was someone higher. All right, come back again to the text. And so they set verse, where was I? Verse 8. Now verse 9. And so the children of Israel did secretly those things which were not right, and they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city, they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. Does that tell you something? The land was covered with idols and places of worship of those idols. What, what a travesty. God's chosen people. And the temple is still down there in Jerusalem. Many of them probably went down and, and worshipped at the temple. Now what does that do? That makes it even worse. Because now they're mixing idolatry with the worship of the true God. That's worse than, than a, a faithful husband, after years of a loving marriage, go having an affair. It's devastating. And see, this is what broke the heart of God. I think it wouldn't have been near as bad had they lost the temple, forgot the priesthood, and then with no alternative, go into idolatry. That had been one. But they mixed them. They mixed them. Now, I'm just having a thought. What am I thinking? What are we doing today? What are denominations and churches doing Today, same thing. You know, I've always used the illustration, and I'm going to use it over and over. I used it not too long ago in the very vestibule of a home where I was going to spend the evening, and I just had the right opening, and I shared this with them. And I want every one of my listeners to have it on the tip of your tongue because this makes it so plain there is no room for argument. And you've heard me do it, but I'm going to do it again. In the last verse of Genesis chapter 1, God looked at creation, and what did he see? Perfect. A perfect creation. Not a flaw. There was not one speck in all of creation that he could look at and say, well, now wait a minute, I better, I better change that a little bit. No. It was perfect. So what does he do in chapter 2, verse 1 and 2? Sat down. He rested. Well, why not? There wasn't anything else to do. Everything was perfect. All right, now we jump all the way up to Hebrews chapter 1. I'll let you look at it. Come all the way up with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Oh, I wish people could just get there through, through their spiritual thinking. That this is where it's at. Hebrews, chapter 1. Might as well look at verse 2 so that verse 3 will be completely explained. <clears throat> Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 2. The God of verse 1 hath in these last days... Now, always have to stop and remind people, remember, that Christ's first advent was the beginning of the last days according to the Old Testament prophecies. All right, so the God of the Old Testament prophecies 
has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he, the God, the triune God, has appointed heir of all things, by whom also God made the worlds. Now verse 3. Who? God the Son, being the brightness of his glory. He was God. He was the creator with all the power of the Godhead. All right, so he was the brightness of his glory. He was the express image of his person, that is, of the Godhead, upholding all things by the word of his power. Now, do we establish who Jesus Christ was? I hope it does. The God of creation, the God of glory. All right, now then, when this great God of creation with all the power of the Godhead, by himself had purged our sin. Now stop a minute. Where was that accomplished? At the cross. See, and that's why when people jump on me as being too Pauline, how can you be too Pauline when all you know is the preaching of the cross? I'll never back down. They can scorn all they want. I will never back down. It's the preaching of the cross that Paul is constantly emphasizing. All right, here it is again. When he had by himself the work of the cross purged our sin. What did he do? He sat down. Why? For the same reason he sat down in Genesis chapter 2. The work of the cross was so perfect. It was so flawless. There was nothing that could be corrected. There was nothing that could be added to it. It was complete. It was all sufficient. And so he could sit down and rest. It's finished. And immediately, as soon as it was revealed, I feel primarily through the Apostle Paul, what's the first thing mankind starts doing? Mixing other stuff with it. Mixing it. Mixing it. Most of my people across the country now realize the word is blenderized. <laughs> See? They put it all in the blender and they turn it up on high and then they parcel it out. Now, is that a finished work? No. It's adulterated. It's been adulterated by whatever. I don't have to name them. All I do is create enemies if I do that. So I'll let, I'll let you do it. But, oh, beloved, <laughs> it was so complete. And now what does God ask us to do with that finished work of the cross? Believe it. Believe it. And then repentance will follow. Absolutely, my, we hear it every day. We're ungodly men, and I'm not just thrilled that we get so many letters from the men. Ungodly men say that when they believed this, their whole life was changed. Well, a changed life is a what? It's a U-turn. And what's the U-turn? Repentance. But can you, can you make a U-turn in the flesh? No way. I will again stand here until I'm gone. You cannot repent in the flesh. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to make that U-turn. But oh, once you make that U-turn, everything changes. Everything is different. All right, so here we have it, that twice God did something so perfect that nothing dared be added to it. All right, now I guess I just about forgot why I came back here. <laughs> but I came back to go to Galatians chapter 1. And remember, I'm dealing with the fact that Israel was mixing idolatry with the worship of the true God of Abraham. They hadn't forgotten the temple. They hadn't forgotten the work of the priests. But rather than traipse down to Jerusalem, they just thought it was better to embrace an idol. All right, now today we're dealing with the same thing, and that's why I'm here in Galatians chapter 1. Verse 6, 
And I don't see how anybody. Now, I know I've got a lot of pastors and preachers listening to me, and I'm addressing them just as well as anybody else. Beloved, look at what the book says, not what Les Feldick says. What does the scripture say? And as I said here, not too many programs back, so far as I'm concerned, Paul's epistles could just as well be written in red because every word he writes came from where? The ascended Lord Jesus Christ. Never forget that. This isn't Paul speaking his own mind. This is Paul speaking the very words of Christ. Verse 6, Galatians 1. And he says, I marvel, I'm amazed, that you are so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ out of their paganism. They had turned their back on all that. They had made some headway in this life of forgiveness and grace. But then what? They succumbed to another gospel. Now the next verse, which is not another these false teachers didn't come in with something totally different. They just said, well, that's okay. You rest on what you're believing, but you've got to be circumcised. You have to keep the law. You have to eat right. You have to do this right. See, that's what, and they fell for it. All right, now read on. So it's not another, but there be some that trouble you and pervert. What's the other word for pervert? Adulterate. Where are you, Angelo? <laughs> we were just talking about it yesterday. Adulterate. And adulterate means you bring in things that don't belong. All right, and so he says, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Why? Because they're adulterating that perfect work of the cross. And God won't have it. Oh, they can have glowing experiences. They can probably even have glowing testimonies. But if they have mixed something with that finished work of the cross, I think they're wasting their breath. I think God's going to be a lot more particular than most people think. And it's scary. Because if he has done a job so perfectly and has made it known and we walk it underfoot, then what? Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.